So uh, thank you for that kind introduction, David. So uh, David, as he was organizing uh, uh, this conference, came up and uh, said, well, we'd love you to talk about the, all, the background, everything leading up to the current era. Uh, I, I said, okay, you mean I've got to summarize basically the history of the universe until, say, 2011? He said, yeah, yeah, and you have 20 minutes to do it. And I said, well, okay, I can do that. Um, uh, it's, really, it's really been an extraordinary ride. I've been working in melanoma for about 15 years. And uh, particularly the last five years, it's just been, just been phenomenal. But... I, th I think I'm able to appreciate, appreciate more what has happened because I knew what the world was like before then. And so I'd like to share that with you so that perhaps you also can appreciate as uh, uh, my fellow speakers come up and discuss, uh, discuss the new world, how, how significant the change really is. So does anyone remember what they were doing on March 25th, 2011? Raise your hand. Okay, we got, we got one back there. Well, I do. And uh, uh, I was on vacation with my family. Uh, it was the morning, the sun was coming up, and I got on my, got on my phone and was looking at the news. Uh, and actually, I also got an email uh, from some melanoma buddies. And it was a major, major day. And for me, it was a, uh, I view it as a, uh, a line that we crossed in the sand. Uh, a real, uh, that was a really significant day in this field. And at the end of the talk, I'll, uh, you're, you'll perhaps appreciate that as well. So, but talking about, thinking about melanoma, um, historically, uh, melanoma used to be a rare disease. Back in the 1930s, the estimated lifetime incidence of developing melanoma was about 1 in 1,500. So uh, a uh, practitioner in general practice might see uh, two or three cases of melanoma during the course of an entire lifetime of medical practice. Now over the years, you can see this is what, does this actually project there? No, it doesn't project very well on the screen, so. Oh, yes. Um, so over the years since then, uh, you see uh, the incidence going up, uh, 2015, it isn't projected anymore, it's actual, about one in 50 persons in the United States will develop melanoma at some point during the course of their life. Um, in Australia, which is the epicenter of our current epidemic, uh, there are areas of Australia where, uh, I think it's among males, the risk is one in 23. So basically one child in every grade school class is going to develop melanoma at some point during their life uh, uh, in that population, uh, at least in the setting of Australia where they've taken a, uh, an at-risk population of northern Europeans, they've transplanted them to the tropics, uh, and they've encouraged them to take all their clothes off and have an outdoor lifestyle, and then they've poked a hole in the ozone layer. Um, uh, the skin cancer as a whole consumes a greater portion of their health budget than any other form of cancer. And that's not just melanoma, but that's also non-melanoma skin cancer. There is good news here. Uh, melanoma is highly susceptible to early detection and early treatment. So my, my uh, colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Gardner, who talked before me, identifying those cases early, uh, and then Dr. Dr. Bird helping cut it, cut it out, turns out to be a highly effective treatment for this condition. Um, uh, this, this is data, this is going back to the 1950s, and again, you can see this, this uh, epidemic sp really sweeping up in the mid-1970s, probably, probably related to changes in our relationship with the sun, but the death rate associated with this condition has not similarly increased. Had it done so, melanoma right now would have the mortality impact on our, on our society approximately the same as colon cancer, which uh, is considered one of the big four in terms of uh, 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 forms of cancer. So actually, we have been relatively successful. The cure rate in the United States is close to 90% of patients diagnosed with melanoma will be cured of their condition primarily by surgery. Uh, uh, in Australia, where they've made it a national priority, uh, early, early case detection, pre uh, primary prevention as well. Um, actually, their cure rate is a little bit higher, about 92%. So if you don't want to get uh, melanoma, don't go to Australia. But if you, if you do get melanoma, you want to be in Australia. <laughs> 
So this is probably the most important slide I'm going to show you. Um, the A, B, C, D, and I, there's an E and an F uh, for recognizing melanoma, uh, uh, asymmetry of the borders of a, a lesion on the skin, uh, or ace, rather asymmetry of a lesion, irregular borders, differences in color, and a diameter generally greater than six millimeters. Um, now, melanoma people look at this. Uh, this, is, this is what we use, and we don't just use it to, treat, to, to teach the general public about melanoma recognition. We also, we also use it to teach, for example, medical students. Um, that being said, I, I'm, I'm sure uh, if Dr. Bird was looking at a couple of these melanomas, he'd be, uh, he's probably shaking his head inside and saying, these, these are, uh, there's no such thing as a good melanoma, but these are, these are not very early lesions. We'd love to detect it earlier, but uh, we haven't necessarily come up with the means uh, to uh, systems where we can teach w ways of recognition to get it much earlier. I think evolution, a change in a lesion in the skin, and one that I uh, uh, add F, a fam family or friend, if someone tells you, you know, you ought to have that looked at, it's generally pretty good advice, and you probably should. So th this is how you can help save, one, save someone's life by, by uh, invoking the most effective melanoma treatment we have, which is find it early and cut it out. But that, that last little 10% nut has been a very tough nut to crack, and prior to the 25th of March 2011, there were three drugs approved by the Food and Drug Administration in the United States for the treatment of advanced, advanced melanoma. The first one really is for the melanoma trivia buffs among you, hydroxyurea, which uh, even most melanoma experts uh, don't don't, aren't actually aware is actually an approved drug for the treatment of melanoma. It was approved back in 1967 because there was a 10% response rate. Um, Decarbazine, which was approved when Gerald Ford was president, uh, became effectively our standard treatment for metastatic melanoma. At the time, uh, it was approved. Uh, evidence was presented to the, the FDA that uh, they could demonstrate a 23% response rate. That means using either physical examination or the x-ray uh, types of studies they had available at the time, which was primarily chest x-rays, they could show that in about a quarter of the patients, they could, sh they could achieve some shrinkage of a tumor by administration of that drug. Uh, interleukin-2 was approved in 1998. It, it probably has a more compelling, compa compelling case for the approval. Um, it is uh, a molecule that is actually produced by our own body, by our immune system, as a signaling molecule. Uh, I, I, j uh, when I'm trying to describe it in simple terms, I say, well, this is a molecule that basically takes your immune system and turns all the switches on at the same time. Um, it, it's produced, uh, there's some states when it's produced in excess, uh, uh, one of them we call septic shock, um, and so it can, it can have a downside, but work, uh, but work that was done at the National Institutes of Health over many years, interestingly, by someone who, who, was, uh, who, I, who was a surgeon, um, uh, demonstrated that you can actually, once we were able to produce it and administer it under controlled conditions, you actually can achieve we don't, you know, we're sort of hesitant to say the, the cure word, but yes, with experience that goes back to the, to the late 1980s, we can demonstrate there are people who were treated with this condition who had metastatic melanoma, who'd been in, who were in remission and remain in remission more than 20 years after treatment for metastatic melanoma. And that was about 10% of those that you treated, but because of the uh, uh, significant physiologic implications of giving it, you really could only target it to a minority of the patients that we saw. And that, nevertheless, that what we call the durable complete response rate, which really has held up over time, that's what led the FDA to approve that agent in 1998. But a key point is, so the gold standard for evaluating a new therapy at this point is a randomized trial. So uh, uh, now we don't use coins to decide what someone's going to get. We use a computer that's programmed to do it. But in essence, a coin flip, you're either going to get treatment A or treatment B, and we're going to compare them. Uh, but no approvals in melanoma had been made based on that. It wasn't, it wasn't from lack of trying. Now, I was trying to think, well, how do I convey this to you? And I could go through and list numerous experimental trials that we conducted where everything was great, it had a great background, it worked in the mice, and then we, we did the big trial, and it just didn't pan out. Um, but that, I don't think that's, that's quite as instructive as something we call a meta-analysis. And this is one of my favorite 
my favorite academic papers, and I'm going to get some of the key points, uh, there's still some of the key points from it for you. Meta-analysis we, is we take our experience, um, we, try, we take many different studies, and statistically we pull them together to try to answer a question. So the studies may be a, a little bit different, but they have a common theme that we can, we can uh, uh, use, we can investigate statistically. And here, uh, the purpose of this was to try to identify benchmarks. So moving forward, this, was, this came out in 2008. We said, boy, you know, we've done all these trials. Um, not, a lot of, not a lot of things have worked. As we come up with new ideas, we have to have something to compare it to to know if it's actually something that has promise to then take to what we would call the phase three trial stage, which is going to be a much more complicated and expensive undertaking in order to try to prove or disprove that something works. And so what uh, this group did is they took about, um, I believe it was about 40 some odd trials. There were 70 groups of patients who received treatment. It was, uh, uh, I think, approximately 3,000 patients who were enrolled in all these trials that took place between 1975 and 2005. And they statistically combined them. And we had judged in that time that, that these things probably didn't work, uh, or they were certainly no, but none of them was clearly better. So we brought them all together to get some numbers as to what constitutes what we would expect in that era. And these are some of the key results, and I'll explain these graphs. They're actually not as complicated as they necessarily look. So A, um, so I, I should say on this axis is uh, the size of a given trial, the number of patients enrolled. And on this axis over here, we have the proportion of patients who are alive at one year after enrollment. And over here we have something called PFS or progression-free survival. That means someone's alive and uh, the, the treatment still appears to be benefiting them because the disease has not gotten worse. And there it's looking at six months. Um, and so each of these little dots is an experimental trial. Uh, uh, so here, for example, uh, is a trial that had about 60 patients in it. And among the patients in that particular trial at one year, approximately 20% 20, 20 of them were still alive. And so when, we, when you took all of these individual trials here and they glommed them together statistically, on average, on average, the one-year survival was about 25%, about a quarter of the patients from the time of enrollment were still alive one year later. For progression-free survival, another measure that we commonly use in clinical trials to try to get somewhat of a quicker answer, the answer was uh, it was about 15% of the patients were still participating in the trial six months later. But there was other information that came from this as well. You see these, these solid lines here. That, that's what we would call confidence intervals. So that's trying to get some idea of, well, you know, what would be something that, that really looks good? And if something's really looking good, you'd want it to be in this area. So maybe if it had 75 patients and 60% were alive at one year, that would be telling you, well, this is, this is something pretty substantial. Um, wait, I'm, I've lost my pointer here. Oh, there it is. Uh, so notice here, that though, that if you have basically less than 40 patients in your trial, uh, you better have penicillin for melanoma or you're not going to detect it according to this particular study. And I cannot tell you how many experiments we did with the best of intentions, which did not, frankly, from a statistical standpoint, have enough patients enrolled to detect a potential benefit, although there, wa there wasn't any obvious signal that we were missing something that actually was active, but we were saying it wasn't. Now, there was an attempt to souse out, well, well, what is determining outcome among the patients who were enrolled in these trials? And uh, anyone who treats metastatic melanoma gets, gets a feeling, I mean, that people come in and there's some people that seem to live a very long time with the disease, and then there's other people who didn't live very long at all. But what was, what was so there was, was clearly some difference. But what was explaining the differences in these trials? And I'll tell you, so down here, this is when the trial closed, what year? And you might say, oh, well, you know, later trials after 1990 are looking better, but statistically in the end when this all got, went through the washer, that wasn't significant. Uh, um, so treatment 
wasn't significant among these trials. What was significant was up here, so performance status. So if someone, uh, uh, their overall condition is deteriorating because of the disease, which is biology, the biology is relatively advanced in someone like that, then they are not going to do as well as someone who comes in and they are doing better. And that was, the fun, to me, one of the fundamental take-homes of this particular, uh, uh, particular paper, is that biology is what was determining the outcome. Uh, and our treatments, despite having you know, some really good uh, biology in the laboratory behind them and a really good reason for doing these experiments, they were, we were just not hitting the key points of the biology. So we went through all these years uh, uh, so, at least in this collection of studies from what we did from 1975 to 2005, nothing was panning out. And I assure you, it was not from lack of effort uh, uh, on the part of either investigators and certainly not the, the patients who participated in our work. But what did we learn? So, one thing we learned is that classical chemotherapy, which really was developed in the 60s and 70s and had a really good theoretical basis and has made some really uh, major impact on, impact on certain types of cancer, it doesn't seem to work for melanoma. Um, design of our experimental trials is very important. It's really critical. Size does matter. If you don't have enough patients enrolled in a trial, you will not be able to answer the question. Measures of, of success. How do you measure success? I described two of them, progression-free survival and overall survival, but you really need to choose your measure of success carefully in order to, for it to match the biology of what you're testing. And biology, I think, is the biggest word. You have to, you have to understand the biology, and it's not just the cancer. We frequently do, would do studies in the laboratory isolating the cells. We'd add uh, chemotherapy medicines to them and say, oh, yes, we can, we can kill these cancer cells, uh, therefore let's give this a go. But you have to think holistically. You have to think of the system, and particularly the immune system. We'd note, we had noted that that was very important, and indeed interleukin-2, which I mentioned, relies on the immune system in order to mediate its effects. So we learned a great deal from this experience. And so that led to this particular trial. I participated in it. Uh, many, many investigators participated in it. It was a key trial with a medicine which I learned to pronounce ipilimumab. <laughs> Although when I used it, it was MDX010. Um, and this, this medic medicine was sort of different. They'd shown in mouse models, I think the work was initially done at Berkeley, um, that uh, using this, this antibody, you could give it to these mice that had experimental cancer. And what it did was induced autoimmunity. So autoimmunity is something we normally think of as bad. It's your, the, the immune system's attacking things, maybe your skin, a derma, causing a dermatitis, or ulcerative colitis would be an example of a autoimmunity. The immune system attacking the body. Well, this was actually intended to do that. And it was demonstrated, yes, this, by doing that, you could actually cure mice of these experimental infections, include, or rather experimental uh, cancers, including melanoma. And as to, uh, go after, after much work, it ended up in a randomized trial. And this was the first randomized trial demonstrating an improvement in survival. And this particular graph, overall survival, so down here are patients who did not receive ipilimumab, and here are patients who did. And there was a difference. It was not a home run. It was not a home run, but there was a clear difference. Finally, finally we had shown we could alter biology in a rational way. And it, interestingly, it wasn't actually doing something to the cancer cells, it was doing something to the host immune system that could alter the natural history of this condition. And critically, there is a tail here. We call that a tail statistically on this survival curve. So there's time, that's the proportion of patients still alive. And there was a tail, meaning not only could you Im overall improve things, but there were people who got durable long-term control. And there are patients from this particular study who are still alive. So this was a key moment in melanoma. 
so taking, I think, an appropriate quote from Winston Churchill, who uh, uh, faced a difficult, a number of difficult situations, um, and uh, finally, finally had some success. I think it was an, it's an appropriate one here for March 25th, 2011, because that is the day the Food and Drug Administration approved ipilimumab, the first drug approved to treat metastatic melanoma based on a survival benefit using and studied using a randomized trial. Now, this is not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. We achieved, finally, being able to show that we can alter the natural history of this condition. And the five years since then have been nothing short of miraculous to me. And my, uh, I hope this, this brief presentation has given you some idea of where we were so you can truly appreciate what my fellow speakers are going to get a chance to share with you about where we are now, almost five years to the day, and where we're going in the future. And uh, when I woke up that morning, the sun was rising, and I assure you it is, real, it is continuing to rise with an appropriate amount of sunscreen uh, uh, for, for our patients with melanoma. Thank you very much.